Great, because before I was, uh, I think, muted. So I'm going to um, give me just one second. That's something that you don't see, but I see on my screen and doesn't allow me to actually see my slides. Can you see my slides now? Not yet. No, not yet. Yep, we got oh. them. You got them. Great. So I think there is a little bit of a lag. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity today. Um, I apologize for giving the talk remotely, but by the time I got this invitation, I was already bookended with two trips, and there was just no way of making it to DC as well. So I especially appreciate the, the technical support from Jessica and others who set this up as a remote presentation. And I'm going to tell you today about the Human Cell Atlas. I'm going to give some motivation, which I think probably resonates and maybe reiterates some of the things that were said yesterday. And if time permits, I'm going to turn at the very end to talk about how atlases are used, for example, in a more medical or clinical setting by people to ask certain types of questions. But that's really only time for me. And so, great. And so I'm going to talk about cells today. Cells are the basic unit of life. And biologists have been, for many centuries, actually, classifying cells into categories which has been done based on very different features. And at first, this was really their structure and location. Over time, this got mapped to the functions that they performed. And really, in the last century, with the emergence of molecular biology, the molecules that they express. Now, knowing cells is important for many things from our very basic uh, scientific curiosity about the world, but in particular for an, our understanding of the genes that cause disease. And this is for the simple reason that while we have the same genome in all of our cells, if we have a specific, for example, disease-associated variant, then even though this variant is pre present in the genomes of all of these cells, the manifestation of the disease really has to do with where the gene product is used. And so if it is used in neurons, we might have a neurodevelopmental disorder, like an autism spectrum disorder, whereas if the gene product is essential for skeletal muscle, muscle function, we might end up with a muscle disorder like muscular dystrophy. So this is all a well-established set of facts, as well as the fact that the human body is made of many different types of cells, about 37.2 trillion of them. Aviv, Aviv, um, we're having a problem hearing on this end because of feedback on your microphone. If you could reposition oh. yourself there. Uh, let me try. Let me try something else. Let me try to do it with. I'm presenting from a computer. I can try and use, let me try. I'm not sure what would work best, but I'm trying. Give me one second. Thank you. I'm not gonna describe exactly what I'm doing now because it's too funny. <laughs> I'm trying to improve this. It, it's already working okay. better. Did we leave it at that? Great. Okay, so uh, the textbook or Wikipedia tell us that there are about 300, 400 major categories of cells. These are things like, you know, neurons and muscle cells, but obviously we all know that there are many, many more sub-subtypes of them, as well as many other features of cells that are not as neat as the categories of types. And so one of the challenges in the past has been that we didn't really have a unifying set of coordinates by which to talk about cells. Because if you looked at them by their shape, that was one set of descriptors. And if you try to understand them in terms of where they're located, it was a different set of descriptors. And even different subfields of biology could use different highlights about cells in order to describe them. One of the benefits of comprehensive molecular measurements, such as in genomics, is that they actually give us a single set of coordinates, the expression level of genes, be it in RNA or in proteins, that, by which we can describe cells. And this, again, has been useful for quite a long period of time, with the minor exception that the way in which we could profile things required us to use many, many cells at once in the context of bulk genomics. And I believe you must have seen a picture, this picture or one like this, by this point in the, by this point in the meeting. And so the bulk genomics uh, methods have been um, uh, we have described them by analogy to a fruit smoothie, where you mix many different pieces of fruit together. You can see some of the dominant things, for example, if there are a lot of strawberries in, but you cannot see all of the components. To see all of those components and their, both their big distinctions and their fine features, you need something that's more similar to a fruit salad. 
And this will be the set of techniques called single cell genomics that analyze individual cells when they are dissociated. But actually in biology, in multicellular organisms, cells are also organized in very precise positions in space and relative to each other, and that's more like the top of the food chart. So two major lines of technological advances have happened over the last several years. The first one, and the one that really motivated the field more dramatically because it happened quick, quickly and had very immediate impact is single cell genomics, and in particular single cell RNA-seq, taking a piece of complex tissue, dissociating it into cells, capturing those cells and increasingly capturing more and more of them faster, faster and cheaper, and um, isolating their RNA, converting it to cDNA, usually barcoding it for the identity of the cell that it came from, sequencing this, and after the sequencing, apportioning the reads and knowing which cell they came from. The second set of techniques in spatial genomics is more of an emerging toolbox. There are many different options in this toolbox, and they usually balance between resolution and genome-wide scale, where you tend to get higher resolution with less uh, genomic information and lower resolution with more genomic information. However, very recently, more and more approaches are emerging that really have what appears to be the best of both worlds. And again, I'm sure by now you've seen some illustrations from some of this toolbox. And with both pieces of this toolbox together, it became clear that these techniques are really part of the real biological world now. They're not just things that are used by specialty labs. They're used more and more broadly. There has been dramatic growth in the scale of the data set, in the ability to apply them across many systems in biology. And there, in addition to that, has been a dramatic growth in biological insights. So in this upcoming part of the talk, I want to take a few minutes just to give people an appetite, possibly repeating some things that you've seen already, of things that our community is excited about in terms of what can we learn when we profile complex tissues and organs at single cell resolution, be it by single cell genomics or by spatial approaches. And here are three kinds of questions that people have repeatedly now answered in different contexts and got good results on. The first is that we can discover cell types that we did not know exist. The second is that we can understand the order of temporal processes in biology. One of the most dramatic one is the development of cells from a fertilized egg to a multicellular organism, but also many other dynamic processes. For example, processes that have to do with adult stem cells, processes that have to do with the emergence and pathogenesis of disease, and processes that have to do with environmental responses to environmental stimuli that happen in cells. And then the third one is that we can increasingly identify the cell program that the cells use that really give them those characteristics, and then these are things in which we can ideally intervene in the context of disease or try to revert to when we want to achieve health. And so I'll give you three extremely quick vignettes to just illustrate how exciting some of these insights can be. The first will be about discovering the cell types that we did not know exist. And so the example here has started with a mouse trachea, and this reflects both work in which I was involved together with Jaywar Jagopal's lab, and also from Aron Jaffe and Alon Klein, and also work from Martin Nawin and Sarah Teichman. So multiple groups have made these related discoveries. And so starting with the mouse trachea, we can look at the different individual cells. In a plot like this, every dot is a cell. The cells are close to each other in this two-dimensional space with a high probability if they were also close to each other in the high-dimensional space of all of gene expression. And the cells are colored, and the color indicates the cluster that a clustering algorithm assigned them to, actually in the high-dimensional, not the low-dimensional space. And you can see that, first of all, we identified the six major subsets of cells that were known to exist in the mouse trachea, but we also found the second subset of goblet cell and the progenitor, a progenitor of a neuroendocrine cell, a second subset of tusk cell and their progenitor. All of these things were unknown, as was this new structure in tissue, and as were two subsets of cells that were extremely minor, very rare, and never seen before by anyone. And when we looked at those cells, one of the things that you can do with a cell atlas, one of the most common queries that you would do, is ask which genes characterize a specific subset of cells. These genes are shown here in the rows. The subset of cells are in the column. The high uh, red color indicates high expression. And by just seeing the expression of one transcription factors and two components of the vacuolar ATPase, we can say these are very similar to cells from other species like frogs, 
and uh, fish, um, which are called ionocytes and are important for regulating, being regulated by and regulating ion balance. And so we call these cells the pulmonary ionocytes. And we were particularly excited because these cells appear to express at high and very specific levels CFTR, also known as the cystic fibrosis gene, which is uh, before this point was thought to be expressed by abundant ciliated cells in the trachea at very low levels. We do not see expression in the ciliated cells. These are the ones highlighted in the top and they're in blue, but we do see very high expression in these ionocytes. And to make a long story short, we showed that this finding generalizes also in human. This is an, uh, a very large number of cells, almost 100,000 cells from a young lung donor. Um, and you can see the expression of the CFTR gene in the ionocyte. You can also see some lower level sporadic expression in some other subsets of cells, but expression does not exist actually in ciliated cells. And we validated that also in the human process. A second example of a vignette is the ability to determine the order of the differentiation of cells. This is work that has been done across the community in many different settings. Just to give you a flavor of this, I'm using here an example from zebrafish development. This is a relatively rapid process that takes about 12 hours from fertilization. And during this process, many changes occur, including the emergence of many different subsets of cells and the formation of patterns. And so there, we profiled 40,000 cells here along a time course. The time course is indicated by the color of the cell. This is knowledge that we have up front, and you can see how the cells are shifting away from each other based on this coloring. At 12 hours post-fertilization, there are dozens of different subsets of cells. And then the question is, can we recover back how these cells came to be? And we may do this with the help of particular algorithms that are devised in order to transverse through this data and try to pseudo-order it back into its, uh, you know, into its glory. And I really want to do it justice by rotating it in three dimensions. And you can see the extremely precise tree that we can recover for how we start with a fertilized egg and how through a series of gene expression changes, we actually end up with cells along the many different lineages. Now, these types of things allow us to do things that could be very difficult for us to do just experimentally. For example, we can try and play back the take. So in this specific example, this is an example from IPS reprogramming, at the end of reprogramming, some of the cells are um, reprogrammed stem-like stem cells or ES-like cells, but there are many other cells in the culture, neural-like cells, stroma-like cells, epithelial-like cells, trophoblast-like cells. And of course, what you would want to know is at which point could you determine where the, um, where the iPSCs come from? And so you can actually work your way back through the model, which is what I'm doing in this movie, to tell you how you go back. And in fact, as early as two days after induction of the protocol, you can already tell which cells will end up in this place around the um, IPSCs, the trophoblast, or the epithelial or neural cells, versus which cells will end up in stromal cells. Now I'm working my way back from the stromal cells to their origins. And this allows you to find what, what regulates this process, how the cells interact with each other, and uh, uh, both optimize it and understand it biologically. And then the third quick example that I'll show you is that we can identify the programs that they use. I will really breeze through this example because my colleague Orit Rosen actually showed it to you in greater detail yesterday. We can take populations of patients, in this case, 15 patients that were treated with immunotherapy and 15 patients that were untreated. We can find cancer resistant signatures in the malignant cells. We can show that these signatures are predictive as to the outcome in patients. And so they are clinically meaningful and we can even try and find drugs that reverse this signature using first computational analysis and then demonstration experimentally. And finally, we can do treatment in animals and downstream from that, hopefully, you know, phase one clinical trials for combinations in patients. All of this was to say, these are the kinds of studies, and you've heard other examples of those already, that have really motivated an international community to say, we need a periodic table of ourselves. At minimum, we need a list of them. We need to know who they are. We need to know their characteristics that we can use it as a reference map. At maximum, we want a full model that explains to us how these cells came to be and what would happen when we intervene in them. And every time that we see them kind of out of whack, what does that actually mean? And that has become the mission of an international community called the Human Cell Atlas. 
um, whose goal is to create a comprehensive reference map of the types and properties of all human cells, which are the fundamental unit of life, unit of life and use this as a basis for understanding, diagnosing, monitoring, and treating in health and disease. Um, HCI started in earnest in late 2016. There was a period of about tw two years earlier where people in the community tried to talk about this possibility. And in October 2016, we really had a kickoff meeting for a year-long planning process that culminated in October 2017 with the release of our white paper that charted a real roadmap to the building of a human cell atlas as an international effort. During this year, pilot projects were launched, data collection was started on a pilot scale, and uh, we started the engineering efforts for building a data coordination platform, we started working groups, we really did some work even during the planning phase. And since the planning phase started, the data is now in full uh, collection mode. Um, this community meets regularly, both in general meetings that happen about twice a year, and in dedicated meetings to take on specific needs, planning processes, and other activity. So to give you a quick snapshot of the Human Cell Atlas community, I actually have to go to our registry every couple of weeks to see where the numbers stand. And so I actually gave a talk about this two and a half weeks ago in New York City, and this slide became obsolete. It used to say 60 countries, it now says 62. 62 countries, 848 institutes, um, spanning about 13,000 members, in many of those cases, those members have labs, and the labs have many people in them who are not individually registered. This is an individual's choice whether to register as an individual member. We study um, multiple systems across the body. Ideally, we study everything across the body. I would say that there are 12 systems of greater focus right now in the community, but any system and any aspect is welcome. And so here is an example of the digestive system. And I encourage you to go online to the registry, both explore it dynamically, and if you're interested in do this work, please read, join HCA. What does it mean to be a member of HCA? A member of HCA adheres to HCA's mission and, and to HCA's value. And these span both scientific values and ethical values. And so we have a steadfast commitment to quality, but also to intellectual flexibility and to an open community that is diverse, uh, inclusive, and equitable. And in this, we mean that we are diverse, inclusive, and equitable, both in the samples of the humans that are analyzed, because this has to be an atlas of humans and not just of one particular human or one particular group, but also in the scientists that participate. And global equity in scientist participation is very important to us. We are transparent and we believe in open sharing of both data code and protocols, but of course within the constraints of privacy and ethics. And we are committed to technical innovation and excellence, as well as to computational innovation and excellence. And computation plays a very big role in this particular initiative, because the data that this initiative collects is only as useful as the computation that, that can run on it. We are organized through a specific governance Structure. Our top governance body is called the Organizing Committee. It can have up to 35 members. Currently, it has 30 members. Its co-chairs at the moment are myself and my good colleague and partner in crime, Sarah Teichman. And we have an executive committee of five members um, that really takes care of uh, daily business, where the Organizing Committee meets on a, week, on a monthly schedule. The organizing committee operates uh, through executive offices. There is an office in the US, in the UK, in uh, the European Union, and an office for Asia. And they help maintain the registry, arrange the meetings, and other kind of uh, daily HCA business. We have a data coordination platform that will hold all of the data for HCA. I will talk about it more. It is governed through a governance group, or the DCPGG. We have working groups for, for specific areas, ethics, analysis, um, uh, standards and technology and so on. And uh, we have the registry that I already described to you where both individuals and projects that participate in HCA are registered. And I am pointing out again that we have a very detailed white paper that goes through all of these aspects, both scientific, technical, and, um, and organizational. Uh, I want to highlight that we also have a very committed funders community. Our funders are organized in their own forum called the Funders uh, Forum. Some of the uh, strongest uh, initiatives that uh, support HCA activities 
and in which our uh, and that support really the scientists that are in HCA are the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, multiple initiatives from the NIH, including HubMap, the Brain Initiative, the Cancer Moonshot, um, multiple initiatives inside the EU, including um, um, specific calls for the HCA as part of Horizon 2020, the emerging efforts from the Fed flagships, and also local um, activities inside the EU. For example, an initiative in France an initiative in Germany, an initiative in Sweden, and so on. There is a substantial support in the UK from the Wellcome Trust and the MRC, and from additional philanthropies in the US, including uh, the Homesley Charitable uh, Trust that supports the Gut Cell Atlas, the Mountain Foundation that supported the first release of the Immune Cell Atlas, and the Cavalry Foundation that supports all the meetings for HCA. And in addition to the funders' individual forum, there is also a joint coordination committee with representatives from the funders and the organizing committee for HCA that uh, convenes uh, quarterly. Finally, on the governance, I want to highlight some key policies that HCA has uh, developed or is in the process of developing. There are policies for ethics around values, guidelines, and principles. There is in progress the development of a help desk for the HCA community. We are, of course, comply with all local ethics laws and regulations. So for example, we have a task force at this moment together with representatives from the EU to develop a policy that is compliant with the EU GDPR. And in this, we're actually at the forefront of genomics. And often as we develop these policies, we believe that they will become useful for many other fields besides the HCA itself. And we are also, as I said, committed to uh, policies around global equity. We have a publication policy. We, our draft uh, data release policy is currently under review. And we have a very specific uh, set of identity guidelines. And as I noted, we have working groups that really uh, provide the scientific and professional guidance around analysis, ethics, standards, and technologies, and for the engineers in the data coordination platform. One of our core values is the sharing of co code, protocols, and data, being an open community that really allows open science to occur and to be maximally impactful. Um, this uh, uh, really is reflected in three major efforts. The data coordination platform itself, which is an open source activity, our data releases currently in preview mode, which to the extent allowed by ethics are open access, and our, protocol, our lab protocols community. So I'll say a few words on each of these. In terms of the uh, data coordination platform, HCA has a single data platform for all data and all data types. The data platform is open source. Anyone in the world can obtain the code, can clone it, and can run it wherever and however they see fit. The data itself, to the extent allowed, is open access. But when open access is not allowed, for example, for certain patient samples, for certain pediatric samples, and so on, the, there are the appropriate engineering controls for controlled access. The APIs are open, so any portal can connect to the DCP and provide additional analysis and visualization on top of it. It is also developed entirely in the open. If somebody in the world wants to participate, which is something that the open source community really likes, they can. They can go and do anything as they wish, and they get engaged. The uh, key developers are in four groups in UCSC, the EBI, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and the Broad Institute. They're making uh, rapid pro progress in the first end-to-end -end live demo, I'm sorry, was not two weeks ago, it was a few months ago. This slide, I'm so unfortunately, is a little outdated, but this was the first demo. It was the first end-to-end -end offering that starts with two sources of single star rna seq data and ends up with raw and pre-processed data provided to the scientific community and beta testing across multiple groups is currently in progress. While the data coordination platform is being built, Data started being generated in the Atlas. I'll show you a lot of uh, vignettes from it in a moment, a lot of views from me. And so as that data started becoming available for release, we made sure that it was rapidly available for what we called preview, which meant any user in the world could go and download this data in its raw form and use it. And I believe that you have heard uh, at least one talk today that in fact used this release, a part of the census of immune cells, which are a few hundreds of thousands of immune cells, once it was released, has now been used and cited in a whole series of papers developing new methods and also making new scientific findings in immunology. We believe that as, as it is important to share data and to share code, it is important to share lab protocols. And this is actually something in which the biology community has historically not been at the same forefront as the computational community has been. There are now new platforms for the sharing of protocols that are really inspired by the way in which code is shared. 
One of the best ones is called Protocols IO, and the HCA has partnered with Protocols IO to really have an online community with um, actually more than over 200 members now and over uh, um, and at least uh, uh, 60 protocols in it. And this means that as a lab develops a protocol, the lab can share that protocol, others can use the protocol, they can also update the protocol, ask questions, put notes, and people can see those notes and benefit from this shared knowledge. And in this way, the community advances very quickly. So now that I gave you a little bit of a glimpse of how we are organized, how do we actually tackle this monumental challenge of a very large organism? Humans are really big and quite diverse and they have a lot of cells. How do we actually tackle this big challenge to build a real atlas? And so I'm gonna give you a very brief introduction into this and again, send you to our white paper if you want the nitty gritty details. The basic idea that we have is that we proceed on two parallel branches. One is what we call the cellular branch where we analyze individual cells and the other is what we call the spatial branch where we analyze cells in situ in their tissue context. And in each of those, we progress through a balancing act of taking first a very broad view, but maybe not every cell or every detail is captured. And then we go into finer and finer and finer view that are really driven by the information that we learned from the broader view. And so we call this strategy the skydive. Some things that we consider are the fact that the spatial and the cellular views are very mutually uh, complementary and, and they can augment each other. The spatial information is often either lower in resolution or does not have genome scale. And these are things that the single cell data can help with. The single cell data does not have direct spatial registration and the spatial data can help with that. You should know, as I um, have pointed out, that there is a very rapidly expanding toolbox from spatial analysis. There are some of the currently available, available methods. And in order to assess how these methods work and their relative benefits and drawbacks, we have really organized ourselves into a team called the Space TX, which is uh, supported by, by the, one of our funders, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, to really test what initially was about 13 different methods. I believe it's now almost uh, 15 or 16 different methods across the same set of tissues in order to reach conclusions about the um, kind of the consumer reports of these different approaches so that people can then use the right approach in the right context. And a similar comparison is also undergoing for the many methods that exist for single cell RNA-seq. I believe Orit might have said a few words about the critical need to optimize pipelines to obtain and process tissues. And again, these are things that we can share across the community in terms of lessons learned and also in developing uh, more centralized procurement um, options for human tissue. We need also to optimize protocols across many different types of tissues. It turns out that solving the problem in breast is not the same as skeletal muscle. And that is again, an effort that has been undertaken in the community. And finally, we need to find ways of sampling a very large human body where there are also many different types of specimens that can be obtained and each has um, a trade-off, typically a trade-off between fresh and healthy samples and between the ability to collect all different types of tissues and so biopsies and resections can be the closest to a living human, whereas post-mortem examinations give us the broadest access to uh, a really full organ, from, uh, how, however, from deceased individuals. And then we need, it is critical that if we collect tissue, we track the actual position of the specimen as they are portioned so that we can eventually take samples that were taken from many different humans that are of different heights, shapes, sizes, and, de and, and different genders, and put them into a common coordinate framework. This is actually an, a substantial, especially computational challenge because there are phenomena here from many different scales, from gross anatomy to very fine histology. There is substantial variation, both, both between individuals and due to measurement error or measurement limitations. The solution really needs to combine not just new technologies, but also new computation. And this is an effort that's very much ongoing. What would the Atlas actually have in it? We think of it as a multi-phase uh, progress or process, where in the first, uh, we think about the first draft that's kind of on the five-year horizon, maybe four-year horizon by now, and a comprehensive Atlas that's more of a, a decade-long endeavor. 
In the first draft, we originally thought about about 100 million cells from the profiling side. It would likely be a larger number by now just because of technological advances. This would allow us to analyze most major tissues and systems at the histological level, both cellularly and spatially from healthy donors, maybe a limited amount of access into disease, definitely both genders, some geographic and ethnic diversity and some age diversity, but not at the extent that really handles full genetic diversity. Whereas in the comprehensive atlas, we anticipate having about 10 billion cells, all tissues, organs, and systems, full organs mapped all the way through, cellular and spatial branch, healthy donors, mini cohorts of many disease conditions, both of the genders, of course, and not just geographic, ethnic, and age diversity, but really getting to the numbers of humans where we have a better sense of the genetic diversity, although the goal is not to do genetic mapping in disease. So um, I think my time is relatively short now, so I'm going to really close with a few brief views from the atlases. The first is uh, the kidney cell, cell atlas. I'm showing you results from many different perspectives on the atlas, both a developmental perspective and the different phases of development, pediatric and adult kidney, um, as well as kidney organoids. And the ability to, uh, one of the tenets of the human cell atlas is that it is very important that not a single group holds a single organ, but rather that every organ is analyzed in at least three different sites by three different efforts so that we do not fall prey to either systematic error or to too limited uh, human and experiential diversity. Here is an example vignette from the kidney cell atlas analyzing both developmental biology of the kidney and a pediatric tumor, Will's tumor, it was possible to relate the origin of Will's tumor in the context of nephrogenesis. And this is work, I, I apologize for lack of credit, this is work from Maz Hanifa, uh, Sarah Teichman, Nina Klaasworthy, and Sam Bejatisla. Another vignette is from the skin cell atlas. I'm showing here examples both from abdominal samples and from um, other uh, skin samples efforts, both from the US and from the UK, and looking at the skin both at the cellular level and at the spatial level, and this allows you to already find completely new subsets that we didn't even know existed. This is an example from the lung cell atlas. I already showed you one of our most beautiful vignettes, the discovery of the ionocyte, but I think it begs to say that there's actually a lot more that's gonna come out from the lungs. Um, um, studies both in the airways and uh, going down to the lung parenchyma and approaches that are based both on biopsies from living individuals and um, whole lung analysis from uh, transplant material. These are some examples from the gut cell atlas, studies in the colon, in the small intestine in the context of the ileum, um, and in the esophagus. And in each of these cases, both new cell type discoveries, a new cell, um, a new cell state discovery, some of which have major implications for disease, as well as starting to target cells that are historically really understudied in these tissues, for example, the enteric nervous system in the colon. And um, here is an example from the overall um, effort in developmental biology in the context of the atlas that really covers both prenatal and postnatal development in the human, studies from the decidua and the placenta, hematopoiesis in the liver, and heart development. These are really, here is one quick vignette again from the work of Sarah Teichman on the coexistence of allogenic cells in the maternal fetal interface. Again, a very understudied piece of biology, but that has major implications for human health. And finally, I will close with the immune cell atlas that I noted earlier, which was the first release actually from HCA, the top part of it from the bone marrow, the cord blood, and the peripheral blood, and that is now actually in pretty routine use by groups, both technical and computational groups, but increasingly lab biologists that are just interested in the, their genes in their cell, and more will be coming to the immune cell atlas uh, from tissue resident cells and even from the humanized mouse. Or it already described the tumor as cell atlas to you. I want to close with the distinction between data collection and atlas building. And so taking the measurements and tracking them, uh, going all the way back to inferences and queries. And so starting with the measurements and building them up to the organ as well as taking them and being able to do queries about the biology that is really held within the atlas. This would require an assembly process. This is not a trivial process because of the variation, the variation between humans in both size and molecular properties. 
But uh, we believe that this is a, uh, an exciting computational uh, challenge for the community to take on. And it is one of the places where the consortium is particularly critical in ensuring cross-consortium coordination of the effort and monitoring of the process. I'm going to close with the following slide. Um, I, if you remember, I told you that one of our motivations in thinking about atlases was the fact that a single variant playing out across multiple cells means different diseases. And what the Human Cell Atlas aims to be is a reference map. While our focus is on the healthy, as people will start and are starting collecting um, disease samples, they will be able and are actually able today to start answering questions in this context, such as where does my disease risk gene act? Which cells are being disrupted by the disease? What is happening to their program? How are the communications between them disrupted and if patients are being treated by therapies or in the context of the environment are encountering environmental challenges, what is actually the effect of the environment on those cells? It's really a resolution we could not imagine having. And so for this, I actually want to thank a very large community of thousands of members now and that cannot fit in an, on an acknowledgement slide but in particular, Sarah Teichman, my partner and the co-chair for the HCA and our organizing committee. Thank you very much. Aviv, thank you very much. Um, we have time for a few questions. Thank you. Uh, this is Shudin Bharacharya from Michigan State. Um, Dr. Regev, I really enjoyed your overview of the Human Cell Atlas. Um, uh, in thinking along the lines of your closing slides of the disease context, I'm wondering if it may, might not also uh, make sense to think of much like your cell and spatial axis, sort of a perturbation axis uh, to this uh, to this uh, uh, tensor, if you will, of, of the of the cellular maps that you're generating, where those of us who are interested in environmental health or disease can think of uh, a an orthogonal axis along which cells are perturbed and different pop subpopulations of cells may be perturbed to different contexts and trying to quantify those perturbations. Yeah, so while I'm, uh, since I have the ability to just move my slides along, I'm going to skip to a different talk that I gave very, very recently and pick one slide, which I hope I can find, which is this slide. I hope you can see it because, again, right now I'm in a mode where I actually don't see what you see. But on the left side of this uh, slide, I'm gone. I hope you can see it. It should be on the, on the right side and it should say perturb. Yes. And so the answer is wholeheartedly yes in the general context of science, but I think in some sense a little bit out of scope for the human cell access itself, although definitely not for my own personal research and definitely not even for the research of many other participants in HCA, both in terms of their research ambitions and the work that they actually do every day. And I believe that the perturbations actually take two forms. One form is a directed perturbation in the lab. This is actually the top panel. One of the things that single cell and spatial genomics now allow us to do is to deliver perturbations into cells, both in a dish and in an animal, um, by design, is single perturbation, say E would be a perturbation up here, um, but also, you know, B and D would be a perturbation in another cell and read out those perturbations, for example, by single cell RNA-seq. And so after you run a very large screen, you can say, these are the perturbations in the cell, and this is what happened to it. And what is remarkable, you can take this approach to in vivo, to animal models as well, or to organoids in the case of humans. And you can see how these perturbations affect not just the cell itself, but also the environment that is around it. That becomes a remarkably strong tool, especially if you can couple it together with the in vivo data directly from patients, because then you can relate, for example, disease states to some of their genetic controls. And I'll show you in a second how this idea generalizes. The second type of perturbation that we have is the natural perturbations or the undesigned perturbations that happen to humans. And they happen in two different ways, and that's actually the figure at the bottom of this cartoon. And so one way in which it happens is natural genetic variation, the common variation, the one that we all carry in us, and that um, has an impact on our cells. And single cell analysis actually allows you to see the genetics of the individual and the genetics of the cell while you profile it for its RNA. 
that allows us to actually perform EQCL studies, for example, at the single cell level and read out in the end a very rich phenotype for each of these cells. And again, you can relate it back to disease state and disease risk. The second type of perturbation happens in the natural world of the environment that we experience. Disease is, of course, an environmental perturbation, but so are many other aspects. And again, this extremely high resolution of the measurement, looking across a large enough number of individuals, allows you to make those environmental assessments. And if there is one point that I want to add that I did not make today, is that because the data is so high resolution, and because the number of samples from a single individual is actually the number of cells that you look at, then your statistical power is substantially increased. And there are things that in the past we thought require a very large cohort of individuals, but with this higher resolution require a much smaller cohort of individuals and really empower mini cohort studies to a dramatic extent. Um, hi, Catherine McClellan from NIH. I was wondering how the efforts of the Human Cell Atlas are going to integrate with efforts to profile model organisms in different um, in different ways, so that we can kind of draw what we learn from the HCA back into our, our actual you know standard models. How is is that sort of how do you envisage that happening? So this is a phenomenal question and also one that's convenient to answer. So in the context of model organisms, for the key multicellular model organism, we don't just expect, but we now know that at least a subset of that community really wishes to engage with HCA. And the interface point is actually the, there are two key, key interface points. Clearly, the lab methods end up being the same lab methods. And so that, that just happens almost on its own. There's benefit from the HCA. It's a very central force. It invests a lot of time and energy into this. And the model organism community, in a sense, benefits from it. And HCA benefits because many lab methods are easier to develop first or to test first in the model setting. And so there's a toggling back and forth. But the real integration happens on the computational side. And so the data coordination platform will include data also for model organisms. The two that we have already agreed definitively to take in are the mouse data, which is kind of natural and obvious, and also the fly data. The fly community reached out to the human cell atlas community. It organized relatively early. It, it generated a connection with the data coordination platform. This actually went, to give a little bit of a sense of how this works internally, it went to the organizing committee, there were some back and forth discussions and questions, and this is now something that we are going to pursue. And that's when a user would want to study fly data and human data, they will go to one place. The data will be processed in one way. There might be different portals to look at things if you're only looking fly or only looking human, but I would anticipate that there would also be portals that would allow you to do the comparison. And the reason that we know already that this is a very important investment is that we're already seeing great results from the comparisons of mouse and human. And so, for example, in a study of a system um, like the um, enteric nervous system, you can, you can perform a study in human and you can perform a study in mouse. You can find the pieces that are shared. You can also find the pieces that are not, where the mouse would be a very poor model of the human. But in many cases, we find that the places where we think that the model is a poor model, it's because the model is composed differently, but it's made of very similar building blocks, meaning it's the same cells, but in different proportions. When you average them up, they look completely different. But when you look at them individually, they're actually really similar. The one place where we sometimes find that there is lack of correspondence is when something is extremely, for very rare cells, they might exist only in one setting and not in the other. And we didn't even know the cell existed. So we didn't even know that there was a discrepancy. We might have thought the model was great, but it's actually not a great model for the rare cell. And then um, finally, I would note that there are examples where we see dramatic discrepancies. In the retina, for example, bipolar cells between human and mouse are one subset of neurons. They fit basically one to one. Retinal ganglion cells, they basically don't fit at all. There are about 50 subsets of them in human. There are about 50 subsets of them in mouse. They just don't express the gene, same gene program. So doing a lot of studies on, say, the impact of degeneration in those cells could be very hard to port to human, and we didn't even know that. 
So I think that the, 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 the benefit there is, is, is tremendous. It would really allow us to credential our model and to go very easily back and forth between experiments where we have a lot of perturbational and interventional ability into the, back to the human to human patient. Thank you. Hi, good morning. It's Melissa Perry from George Washington University. Thanks for the fantastic talk. Um, very inspiring. I'm an epidemiologist, and I know you have many epidemiologists as colleagues um, at work in some of these efforts. And the big question is, uh, from a population perspective, how do you extrapolate back? So the slide that it clearly explained what the vision is in terms of scope and referred to diversity, that's gender diversity, um, ethnic racial diversity, um, in genetic diversity, how do we get at epigenetic diversity um, and all of the ways yeah. in which everything from environmental exposures to uh, immune function, um, immunologic uh, um, uh, impacts to nutritional impacts, how can you take that into consideration as you capture the millions and millions of cells that you're seeking to analyze? So this is a terrific question, and I'm going to answer it in kind of three parts. So the first part is what we call metadata and how important metadata is, registering information about the individuals that are being profiled as it is collected. It is never going to be perfect. There are limitations of how much you can collect and how good it is and so on, but at least it is you know, front and center in our minds and it's front and center in how data is ingested and processed and so on. And so that leaves you with covariates that later on you could even relate, whereas otherwise you wouldn't have those covariates, you would just be working in the dark. The second layer that I want to say is an analogy that we use from the Human Genome Project. In the Human Genome Project, it is not that people didn't know that human genetic diversity in, in, um, um, existed. In fact, people wanted the Human Genome Project so that they could map that genetic diversity and perform things that ended up being, you know, genome-wide association studies. But they also made the conscious decision to first get themselves a draft genome and the finished genome so that that genome could form a reference map on which you could build this additional dimension of genetic variation. So we are, I would say, partly inspired by this view. We're trying to manage this to the point that we don't overdo ourselves in trying to cover all dimensions all at once, but rather get to an initial reference that focuses more on commonality, but is set up in a way that allows you to then hang on it the variation that exists. And that's true, by the way, both for the genetic variation and for the non-genetic variation, which, um, for many things we call kind of experiential variation, right? The same person with the same genotype on, in one country and then taking a plane, going to another country and having a different breakfast, the cells are going to be somewhat different. They are, but they're also not going to be that radically different that we wouldn't be able to map them at all. It's not that crazy what happens in biology. And so we can have that layer as well. And then the third layer and the one on which we didn't know upfront but given the amount of data collection that has happened by now, and you know, a couple of years in, and work that happened even before those couple of years, we're starting to see what happens when you actually take X number of individuals and profile their single cells. And what happens looks quite coherent, meaning there is inter-individual variation and difference. And at first, we can set it aside and identify the commonalities. But once we find those commonalities, Having looked at a non uh, um, in, uh, insane number of individuals, we can start finding what I would call common axes of variation, meaning features that are not common to all individuals, but are common to some individuals. So they are repeatable and reliable. And this is because of that enhanced power because of the high resolution of the assay. Those things become easier to find when you get that many shots on goal in any given individual. And then you realize there is a subset of individuals that activate a particular program in a particular cell type. And I can find that subset and I can find it reproducibly and I don't need to look at that many. I can start relating it to these many covariates from the metadata and try and make these environmental connections. And so that is, uh, that is one of the things that I actually found um, 
very exciting in studies that are of what we call a mini cohort, maybe 10 healthy individuals and 10 individuals with a disease condition. We have done one of those, for example, with Ramnick Xavier. I didn't talk about it today. Um, and when we compare them, healthy individuals are really reproducible across each other. But disease individuals also are kind of reproducible in their diseaseness. They might not all be the same, but they kind of fall into things that are recognizable in terms of what the cells are doing. And then you can start thinking about exposures, like the drugs that they get exposed to and the responses that they would have to those drugs. And you see reproducibility there as well. And because of that, I would say, I think we're on the right track. Yeah, that's excellent. Uh, adding it into the aspirational vision, I think, for the next presentations will address so many questions that come up. Yeah, so, I, thank I you. actually had, just if, if, if I may, give me one second. Oh. Give me one second. I don't usually do that toggling between talks, but I'm back to the original one. If I may, I had an extra little piece at the end. I was trying to be very mindful of everyone's time. I thought I had like five minutes left. I want to leave them for questions. But I did have an example on how we look at that in the context of colitis and trying to think about both this GWAS question and the response to the disease. And this is an example of a real study. Just so you know, it exists. There are 100,000 cells, 17 individuals, two samples from each, so 34 samples. Some are healthy. Some ulcerative colitis, here are their cells. And they don't look like something insane. And there are 51 subsets of them. That's a lot of different cells. And those subsets vary in their proportion. So that, and you can see how small the error bars are from many of those proportions within a category of healthy, non-inflamed and inflamed, but how significant the changes can be. Meaning in each of these categories, the composition of the tissue changes a lot. And some of these cells, we either didn't know this cell type existed, um, or we didn't know it existed in this tissue, or we knew it existed in this tissue, but we basically knew nothing about it, and we didn't know if it was important for the disease or not. And now we're getting these very, very granular answers, and you can even map, you know, the GWAS genes to them. You can say, for each of these GWAS genes, which of the cell types does it fit in? You can relate it to how they respond to anti-TNF therapy. You can do all of those things. That's reality today. But it is, that's not the atlas itself. That's what the atlas enables you to do. Fantastic. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Okay. Well, thank you again, uh, Aviv, for a really inspiring talk. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I really regret that I cannot stay there longer, but I know that some of my uh, best colleagues are in that room. So I hope, uh, I hope there will be a lot of uh, productive discussions. I'm happy to provide feedback um, afterwards if it's useful. Again, thank you so much. Thank you.